Welcome to the Dead Pixel Society podcast, the photo imaging industry's leading news source. Here's your host, Gary Peugeot. The Dead Pixel Society podcast is brought to you by Media Clip, Advertech Printing, and School Photographers of America. Hello again and welcome to the Dead Pixel Society podcast. I'm your host, Gary Peugeot, and today we're joined by Gary Wong, the co-founder of Film Never Die in Melbourne, Australia. And he's got a very interesting story about keeping film going. Hi, Gary. How are you today? Hi, Gary. I'm good. How are you? Two Garys taking on the world right now. Come on. So tell me a little bit about your company. You've actually been in the film processing business for a long time. Uh, you know, since digital has been in, in in the market, but you've really said film is where it's at. Tell me about how you decided you were going to go into the chemical processing biz. Yes, thanks for having me, Gary. Um, so we actually only started developing uh, the wet lab, kind of mini lab sort of thing since 2018. But uh, the story of Film Never Die goes back to 2011. Right. Um, actually the Christmas season of 2010, when uh, me and my girlfriend back then, uh, now my wife Wei Wei, were living in a small apartment in the slightly northern part of Melbourne, uh, Victoria, uh, city of Melbourne in Parkville. And she wanted a Polaroid camera for Christmas. So I'm like, great, let's get you a Polaroid camera from, I think it was eBay or Gumtree, which is like Craigslist uh, in, in US. So I bought her a Polaroid camera, which is a Polaroid Spectra camera, mm -hmm. the wider format yeah. one. And then I realized I couldn't get any film. <laughs> 2010 is when uh, Polaroid just announced they were, oh, they, they announced that they were shutting down factories. And um, yeah, it was before Impossible took it over. So during that period, you couldn't get anything. That's right. So I'm like, oh, there's this impossible thing happening. So, okay, let's get, get some film from Impossible Project. Uh, I think they were in Austria. They're still in Austria. Uh, they obviously rebrand uh, to Polaroid Original and things like that now. So um, they, they did us a very good favor in, in the sense that their uh, shipping was very generous. Let's put it that way. You can buy as much film as you want and only pay $60 for DHL shipping across the world. Mm. Um, so doing what I do, I bought the maximum I could just below the import uh, duty or GST threshold, good and services tax in Australia. Um, so I bought 60 pack of film just under a thousand dollars and i gave 10 to my wife um uh, my girlfriend back then and i resell the rest on ebay and they sold mm -hmm. very quickly in fact so i'm like oh there could be something there so that's how essentially the business started from just buying film about and start reselling them mm -hmm. and uh, slightly go grow into polaroid cameras uh 35 mil film mm -hmm. uh just because once I get into this, I realize, wow, there's still a bit of market in definitely in Polaroid, mm -hmm. but the lenses in the film cameras and the build quality they are still so amazing. Mm -hmm. Sure, you can still take fantastic photos from film cameras, and I, I do need to confess, back then I I was the, truly in the digital. That's where I started, mm -hmm. or oh, except for my primary school photos where we we'll bring a point and shoot to the class back in Malaysia. Right, but I bought my um, Alpha two hundred, mm -hmm. it's my Sony first one just a few years before and then I discovered this whole film thing and back then you still can buy film quite affordably cameras wise um, yes. and uh, that, that's how business was born so but it's, it's kind of a jump to go from you know instant film packs where you don't have to do anything to starting up yeah. a film lab which is what you did yeah, so, yeah. why did you make that jump because I imagine you know there would be a lot of people who are saying you know the instant side was enough there's no, really no reason to create a film processor is there and but you went we went that route so we were very lucky to have a dwelling where there's a, a garage that's a separate unit so i i did all my research i ran my first shop off that garage this has a different entry as well so when we were running that we initially started with uh polaroid and we started with film 35 mil film and camera mm -hmm. and back then there were only kill was starting up as a it's a film processing just focusing on film processing so not until we were in 2018 where we moved to different premises we thought hey there could be something here 
uh, what about a more of a one-stop solution for people that want to buy film, uh, learn about cameras and process as well, because uh, we focus a lot on doing photo walks and uh, mm -hmm. uh, offline events where we connect people and just give them an opportunity to learn about film and, uh, and photography, really. Mm -hmm. um, so we definitely see a market back in 2017, 2018. And we say, hey, you see, you can buy some film processor for quite affordably back then about $2,000. With a bit of uh, trial and error, you can get it up and running. It's definitely not nowhere close to what they call pro lab. They still like more like try and testing lab. Right, yeah, so yeah. we actually launched our first campaign, um, trying to raise money to get a space and a, a processor. And uh, we raised about $20,000 on our first Kickstarter campaign, um, thanks to our supporters. And then we went off to start uh, the processing business. But but you're right, it's definitely a bit of a jump uh, because, and actually not until recently, uh, then we realized how much of a jump it is because recently uh, we started to do more of the QC side or the of what a pro lab would do. Uh, we're still learning, but mm -hmm, trying to sure. get, make sure the chemistry is right, the replenishing side right. Um, but to be honest, back then in 2017, 2018, mm -hmm. as long as you sort of got the ballpark of chemistry right, a lot of the work is done on the scanners, as you probably know. The scanners would do all the color correction. Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like you could almost, yeah. I mean, as long as you were getting something on the film strip, you could probably get it through. And to be honest, a lot of people who are into that sort of, that look uh, probably liked it, that it was a little maybe... Uh, off color a little bit yeah that's right and the whole lamography movement definitely yeah, added to that awareness as well so uh i guess we are very lucky because if you imagine impossible project when they first started the color was way off yeah you'll be lucky to get a photo when you first started you need to make sure you shield it properly it was not uv shield and we created all sort of different materials to teach our consumer our customer how to do it properly sure. um, so there was a bit of I guess that's a blessing disguise it because the main retailer would not carry that stock because it's so experimental. Mm, sure. As you probably know the story about the blue dye was not in existence anymore. And uh, because how Polaroid uh, actually pro project the sales for five years and buy all the raw material in, in year one, so they can sell enough film for five years, but they sold everything in year four. Uh, if you remember the story, mm. so it shows that there's actually more of a demand and supply. So, but then at some point you realized you want to create your own processor. So mm -hmm. talk about that. I mean, that's another big leap. I mean, there's been a lot yeah. of people who started photo labs who don't want to create a film processor piece of equipment. So yeah. um, it started out as a, as a Kickstarter project, right? Yes. Yes. So when we did our first Kickstarter, after doing some research, we realized the really good Kickstarter campaign don't start their product, a product in, day zero and start selling the idea before they have a product right a lot of successful campaigns already started the motions of creating and even having a product in supply chain and just needed the support before they can right uh using kickstarter more like a marketing campaign if you like sure. and make sure they can over deliver on their product so uh once we understood that uh we uh, but before that, we because we were dealing with Fuji processors and old Fuji scanners, we use a frontier system. Mm -hmm. And we know that's very hard to get parts and uh, very hard to get qualified technicians to, to help out. So a lot of uh, trial and error. And we, we, we know it's, it's just a fact that it's going to run dry one day with all the parts and things like that. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I mean, over here in North America, I know several people who have, you know, Fuji film processors and they've got, you know, two or three spares for parts just in the back, just for that reason. That's right. That's what we did as well. We literally, uh, for the past few months, been salvaging parts from one to the other. We definitely have more ambitious uh, goals from just a drum processor, but I guess it's always good to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. So we actually need to attribute this to one of our previous uh, staff, uh, Mike Liu, who is a product designer. Mm -hmm. uh, when he first came to us in Film Never Die, he actually wanted to do a camera, a 3D printed 120 camera. And then we realized it's such has such a plethora of experience and, um, and knowledge that 
he can actually design or recreate a processor based on the super psychic. If you if you heard of the super psychic from Phototerm before, right. which is an amazing machine. Um, so uh, based on that design, he went to did some work and came out with the CP800. But you're right, it's definitely a big jump and I still kick myself on trying to do something like this because it's definitely very audacious. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> especially being the photo market because film as is a, such a delicate uh, material and uh, I guess uh, media to play with. So it's actually very, uh, if you can say high stress uh, sometimes because you're dealing with people's film, right? right. <laughs> you could ruin them very easily. Yeah. So I still kick myself sometimes, uh, very often, I'm like, oh, why do I want to do this? <laughs> <laughs> So you tried to do a Kickstarter on the original processor and it didn't really work out in that iteration. So where is it now? Because now you're you're going to be producing it for sale, correct? Is that how yes. that works? So what yes, is the difference right. between the two models? Is there a difference? Yes. When we first raised money for Kickstarter, we wanted to want to raise somewhere around three hundred sixty thousand uh, dollars, mainly to actually pay some of our staff in the R and D staff, uh, and actually grow the team a bit bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, it's very different from having one product to having a ship ready product. The whole design manufacturing process uh, the supply chain is all a different uh, ball game so we we knew that from the get-go and um we realized to actually get the masses of skills or the economic of skills we needed to produce a machine that's quite affordable we need to sell about 100 machines so 100 times 3006 100, that's where we get the uh, $360,000 from. So the original machines was definitely more ambitious, uh, wanted to do a bit more automation and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But once the Kickstarter didn't really go through because we only raised about $50,000, which is still quite amazing at, at, at the hindsight of it, because who would bet on a company that hasn't done it before and want to bring a product out? So we needed to scale back a lot of, um, a lot of the features, if you like. The, the product was 80% there mm -hmm. and the last 5% or, or last 20% is, is obviously the tricky, very tricky. And the last 5%, as you know, is probably even trickier yeah. <laughs> because <we get> it. <laughs> yes. exactly. That's it's just crazy. how products work, right? Yes, that's right. So I, I, I'm very glad that I like to say that we are probably at the last 5% of it, just trying to iron out a few more things and just, we need a bit more user feedback as well uh, so that people can give us their input and things like that and how the machine can work with the uh, the real life in the real world i guess so so how many how many functioning units are there out there i mean do you have inventory or using it yourself or what's the what's yes. the status of the uh i guess we should call it the cp800 right Yes, that's right. CP800 stands for Compact Processor 800. Mm -hmm. we, we actually initially wanted to not launch a product, but actually design a system right. uh, where we support labs. And what I mean by that is we actually have, uh, we, we, we've we been leveraging on things like Airtable and Zapier to create automation for film logging system. Mm -hmm. If you know, like the twin checks, we have barcodes so we can scan and make sure we tag them properly and do some automation stuff at the back end once the films are ready. Uh, like automatically stand out, automatically uh, ask for payments and things like that. So we create a bit of a system which, which is where we're trying to license it out as well. And then with the hardware, so we've got a software sort of things and with the hardware, and if we can do the hardware well, we, we, we figured that we can license it as a bundle to support different labs. Mm -hmm. So that was the initial uh, idea, but obviously to, to even start something like, or create something like a Kalenta pull through machine, mm -hmm. you, you need more than a few hundred thousand dollars. So I'm like, okay, let's, let's put it out there. You know, um, does anyone even wants it? You know, you, you, you never try until you put it out there to, to see if you can feel right. fast or learn fast. Right. Right. So, I mean, you've got, production units processing uh, yes, film software. today it's not just a yes. idea on a napkin so there are yes. actual yes. units in production so what have you learned putting it into production yes so sorry let me answer that question uh, again so we have one machine in our lab mm -hmm. uh, and two in the shop or r d place which is mm -hmm. the shed in my house <laughs> <laughs> um, 
<laughs> um, so being a uh, work on and try to improve and uh, trying to see where we can improve, but we have one production uh, machine. Um, the track record of the machine uh, or the track record of how we've been using CPE and Android, I must, uh, I'm quite happy to say we process uh, at least 500 rolls of film through it. And um, there's uh, definitely a few issues initially, but we slowly uh, get, the, get the gist of it. I think it was June this year, we had a pop-up lab in Darwin, Australia, up in the northern end. Mm. Uh, we did a pop-up lab called Tropo Film Lab with some of the local labs and the artists there in Darwin. And we process about 200 rolls of color film through that machine. Um, for us in Melbourne, it's mainly a black and white machine okay. uh, because of our roller pull-through machine. So uh, as far as I know, uh, there's one working uh, like production uh, workhorse model, if you like. Um, but to be very honest, because it's such a new machine and we do have a team of about five people in the lab, mm -hmm. so it's still a bit of a training sure. to get people uh, learning and getting comfortable with the machine. So that's what I'm doing at the moment to, to try to get the people on, the team on using the machine more as well. But we have one, but we sold about, I want to say a handful of machines so far. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one in Australia that went to a lab in New South Wales. Uh, we have one uh, that we shipped, but there, bit, there was a bit of shipping issue so that you need coming back for a bit more repair uh, before we resend that out. Mm -hmm. That's actually one of the challenges as well, how you make sure you pack it properly sure. and you, you make sure all, all the stuff are good in terms of a production unit. So definitely the, the first uh, prototype, uh, this one in um, Belgium, which is sort of our sister lab, if you like, that's not working, that needs to be uh, mm. because of the first shipping uh, issue that we have overseas. We didn't realize so much thing could go wrong when you ship stuff across the world. So, and then uh, I think that's, we actually sold two to New York. So there's uh, people from America buying our machine as well, which is fantastic. So uh, we are getting those ready as we speak and we ship in, in a few weeks. So what are the processes that it supports? The uh, uh, black and white colored, can you do uh, E6 slide sort of as, as well? Is a program for yes. that, I guess. Is, is the... That's right. At the moment, it's programmed to do uh, C41 uh, and a few process of black and white, the eight minutes, the 11, the 14 minutes and 18 minutes based on D76 chemistry one-to-one -one, and the E6 process as well. So there's six pre-programmed software or program or processes in there, but obviously you can program it yourself as well, if you like, mm. uh, to get it uh, up and to do whatever you want. Mm. Because the chemical, or oh, sorry, the temperature control is at a separate bath using a sous vide machine right now. Mm. So that's one of the uh, feature we need to cut out from the original proposed model. We wanted initially wanted internally controlled heating system, but that just proven a bit uh, too challenging because you need to regulate more power and temperature. So, and a fifty dollars sous vide machine does a fantastic job. I'm not sure if you know. Like that blew my mind away how how good it is. So, um, uh, well, so uh, we, a fifty dollar what machine? A sous vide machine. You know, the uh, it's like a temperature bath control thing uh, where you can set the temperature and heat up bath of water. Normally, people vacuum seal their food. Yeah, I was going to say, you're talking about the one like you'd cook vegetables in. Yes, okay. that's right. That's right. Yes, okay. yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's what I thought you said. I wasn't sure if we were having a language barrier or if yes. I was just misinterpreting what you said. But you're actually talking about a sous vide machine. Like you cook vegetables in. Okay. That's right. Okay. That's right. That's right. Did I pronounce it properly, Suvi? No, yes. no, you did. You did. I just wanted to make sure I heard it properly. Yes. Oh my goodness. So we we're definitely cooking film as we speak. So that's what we're doing. <laughs> uh, but yes, so Suvi machine to temperature control in a water bath with a chemical. Um, and you can program how long you want the film to be rotating inside the, the tank. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what chemical to come in and go out. That's six channel mm -hmm. for chemistry. So five for chemistry, one for water. And that's the uh, corresponding out while for the as well. So yes, you can program them to whatever process you like. 
Really? Wow. Well, this is kind of cool. So you're actually in production now. Do you have inventory or are they built to order? How does that work? Yeah. At the moment, they are built to order uh, in a factory in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And the factory uh, was quite a story how we got in touch with the factory. And the factory is actually an ISO 9001 approved factory, meaning that they are actually quite a well set up uh, factory. Um, it's made to order at the moment. So that's why if you go to our website, it says shipping in 30 days or shipping in 60 days. Mm. Because it takes about two weeks to make sure we can put all the parts together, mm. test them and things. So it's made to order at the moment. Yes. Wow. So it's can you do custom paint jobs like racing stripes or anything? Or <laughs> Not quite there yet. <laughs> um, we will love to eventually. Uh, I believe if, if you want to pay a lot, a lot more, you, we can definitely do that for you. <laughs> well, obviously something like this, though. I mean, I, I, I mean, just I, I guess we just get out there. What is the cost? for somebody to buy one of the machines. Yes, the machine is a uh, retail at 4,350 Aussie dollar, mm -hmm. Australian dollar, mm -hmm. which equates to just under 3,000 uh, US dollars. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how much we're selling it at the moment. It, there's about 30 days of uh, made to order, or made, made to ship date that we're doing at the moment. Right. Yeah, and if anyone's interested, mm -hmm. go get one. <laughs> <laughs> get two, they're small. So obviously something like this, you know, at $4,000 uh, mm -hmm. Australian a pop, you know, you're not looking to get rich from this. I mean, I can't imagine there's that much profit margin in a piece of equipment. Plus, I imagine you have to do some support and training and overhead. So I'm just, I'm just, as a person who admires entrepreneurs, I'm just uh, amazed that you've taken this on. And uh, what do you think your next project is going to be? Thank you, uh, Gary. <laughs> it's, it's, it's sort of, we need something like this in, in the lab ourselves as well, because we we can actually, my, me myself was able to process 75 black and white and 7.5 hours day shift mm. with two machines. So I, I was able to process 75 rolls of black and white film in a day. Mm. Uh, that's what this machine can do. Um, but the next project, um, which we are very excited about is to eventually having our own scanner hmm. because now we have our own film processor. If you can have our own scanner, which you know, is also the, how many parts I can find in the world kind of game at the moment. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, if you can tie them together, um, I'm very excited to eventually be able to do something uh, that based on all new technologies. Um, and that'll be a very exciting venture, I guess. Uh, once we have that uh, together and we can offer a service that say, Hey, we are definitely doing it, it all based on new technology and we have parts, we have support, we have trainings and things like that mm. to make sure that we can bring it to offer good quality. Great. So where do people go for more information about your film processor? Yes, they can go to filmneverdie.com uh, slash CP800. C stands for compact, P stands for processor. 800 number 800 uh filmneverdie.com slash cp800 and you can see all the details on there as well well thank you gary for your time best wishes on the future success of the uh cp800 and looking forward to hearing more thank you gary thank you for listening to the dead pixel society podcast read more great stories and sign up for the newsletter at www the dead pixels society.com